Good afternoon. My name is Meenakshi. Uh, I've been here for about eight years now. Uh, I predominantly work in uh, the areas of uh, formal aspects of software engineering, specifically testing. In IIIT, I teach uh, uh, courses on discrete math, theory of computation, software testing, formal methods, and uh, uh, teach an introductory course on design and analysis of algorithms. So this is a broad spectrum school. It's uh, called a summer school on theoretical foundations of computer science. Each of us work in an area that is involved in its own right. Uh, so we would probably, you know, give you a very uh, cursory high-level introduction to what we work in the area. It is meant to be like that. Feel free to write to us if you want any additional uh, details or, you know, pointers towards anything specific that we will be talking about. So I will uh, handle three lectures uh, in the school uh, as a part of the summer school this week. And there will be one invited speaker, Professor K.V. Raghavan from IISC, who will talk to you about one specific aspect of formal method called program analysis. So I will try to build uh, some background uh, that will help you understand his lecture. But uh, at the same time, I also would like to talk about something that uh, is more traditionally formal methods, which is model checking. So I'll begin with an introduction motivating why we need formal methods in a very light note, and then we will introduce uh, uh, to mod the kind of models that uh, we would work on. Uh, I will not assume that you're familiar with any of the topics, but it will be nice if you know what a finite state automaton is uh, uh, and uh, what uh, basically a regular language or uh, how to how to take products of, of machines. So. If you know that, uh, I mean, if you've done a basic course in uh, automata theory or theory of computation, it'll it'll become easier to understand uh, some of the aspects that of what I'm saying and a little bit of logic, propositional logic, and discrete maths. So before we move on, uh, so what is formal verification? What does the term tell you about? So I'm trying to verify systems. Verify meaning what? Uh, can you tell me what you understand by the term verification? Any thoughts? This is a post-lunch session, so it has to be interactive. <laughs> Otherwise, I'll be talking, you'll be sleeping. That won't work. Right? Uh, so what is verification? In, yeah? Check if the system meets the requirements. To check if a system meets the user's requirements. Any other definitions? Attempted definition of what is verification? What is formal verification? Why do we add that adjective to it? Any thoughts? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you represent whatever you want to verify with a mathematical model. We want to verify a system, right? Uh, so what do you think is a system in computer science? Verification of a model. Implementation of a model. A model about what? Yeah, so it's a model of what? What kind of models exist in computer science? Models of computation. So can you give me an example? Uh, architecture models, yes. What, another example? Could it be a model of a coffee vending machine? Could it be the model of a, a microwave oven? Could it be the model of a, a, a graphical graphic software that lets you play PUBG game? Could it be a model of that? Which one do you think is, what is, what is modeled for us? So could it be a model of the PUBG game? In computer science, yes. But for formal methods, unfortunately, we can't. We can't consider those kinds of models. Game models are difficult for us. So could it be a model of the autopilot software that runs in, in an aeroplane? Yes, it is very much that kind of a model. Could it be a model of the software that controls elevator in a multi-story building? Yes, it is. Could it be a model of uh, the software that runs Citibank online? It could be a model, but we can't use formal methods. We can't use formal methods to verify stock exchange market of uh, web applications, of enterprise software, because those are large scale software. We can't scale up our techniques. What we can use formal methods are to model and verify software that corresponds to embedded systems or safety critical systems, the kinds of examples that I told you about. A software that could uh, control your elevators, it's embedded system. A software that uh, runs your autopilot, it's an embedded system. Embedded systems can also be large. Like for example, the largest <coughs> embedded system that has been formally modeled and verified 
is the Mars Land Rover. The you remember the uh, uh, thing was sent by NASA to Mars to go to Mars and uh, basically do something, right? So that is also embedded software for us. But the scale of it is massive, big. But uh, when compared to the scale of a software that would run in an elevator or your drive by wire, brake by wire system in a car, right? Uh, so we are we are interested in formally modeling such software and uh, trying to verify them. So that is the formal world. So for us, formal models are usually some kind of models in discrete maths. So they could be partial orders, they could be lattices, they could be finite state automata, they could be anything, right? So those are formal models for us. I will talk about formal models that look like finite state automata. Professor Raghavan will talk about formal models that are partial orders and lattices. If you know a bit of discrete math, you would know what a partial order is and what a lattice is, right? Uh, so this is the thing that I was talking to you about. We all know that ICT systems are ubiquitous. We have software in mobile phones, toys, cars, planes, everywhere. So software also controls, as I told you, stock markets, bank, insurance. So one thing that we want that software is that it should be of very high quality. So the term quality is very generic for us. It might make a lot of sense to a layman, but we want to ask what is quality. So quality could be that software should be correct, should have no errors. Software should be fast enough. It can't take too much time after I type in my password to show me the welcome screen. It, uh, it has several real time constraints and uh, software should have good processing capability and so on and so forth. So we need all these desirable requirements. Right? So before we move on and look at formal methods, let's look at the kind of classical errors that has happened in the history. Uh, by history, I mean something like 20 years, not uh, otherwise, for which uh, formal methods could have helped to avoid the error. This is a very popular quoted error. You might have heard about it. Uh, it's a little old now, but still very relevant. European Space Agency in June 1996 launched this rocket called Arian 5. Because it's a very safety critical, highly cost system, right? Uh, so this rocket was launched in June 1996. 36 seconds after it was launched, uh, it went into a self-destruction mode and plunged into the Atlantic Ocean. Very simple. So you can imagine the number of years of effort, the amount of money that would have gone into it. And uh, the reason for this crash, so we are interested in software errors. You know, we are not interested in communication failures. So the other popular crash, you know, is this, uh, Huh? <coughs> the discovery one, Kalpana Chavla and, and a few others, that, that was not a software error. That was uh, because the heating shield in the this thing was not good enough to withstand the heat as the thing came back into the Earth's atmosphere. But the reason for this is a pure software error. So what was the software error? In the process of doing some routine computation of altitude of the spacecraft, there was an exception that uh, basically converted a 64-bit floating point number into a 16-bit integer and it had to squeeze in into that memory space available and uh, it was not possible. But this is a safety critical software because failure is unacceptable. So the software has a backup, right? So if there is an error in this, there'll be a backup. But the backup software also had the same error. So it wasn't helpful. So it send, ended up sending incorrect altitude information and the rocket was given the instruction of destroy yourself kind of thing, right? Uh, so another unfortunate thing that happened, this is also a little old, uh, uh, there are these radiation machines, uh, most, the biggest company that makes these machines are G, General Electric and Philips. Therac 25 is a radiation machine that gives uh, radiation doses to cancer patients. And uh, so six patients died because uh, instead of giving a specific amount of radiation, it overcalculated and gave extra radiation. So the reason of this mistake was a software error. The problem was so there was a race condition. Are you familiar with race conditions? If you know a bit of operating system, you will know. Two processes are trying to compete for uh, uh, something common. And uh, one process, uh, so they should have ideally mutually exclusive access, but they don't. So they end up causing a data race. So there was a data race in the problem, so this thing, and it caused the wrong sequence of commands. And extra radiation was calculated by the software in this machine. And uh, it resulted in the unfortunate death of a few patients. So this is another popular error that has financial implications. Intel had this uh, processor called P4 processor, which was an old processor. And uh, mathematicians uh, mathematicians use these kinds of processes, uh, 
So mathematicians try to calculate the next large prime number. They get paid to do that, these kinds of cool jobs. So one mathematician was trying to calculate the next large prime number and he realized that this P4 processor was not doing division correctly. And uh, so for example, if you give it some number like this, it should return that because these two will cancel out, but it will return some other garbage. So the problem was the chip made mistakes while dividing floating point numbers within a certain range. So obviously Intel had to recall all its faulty P4. There's no notion of faulty, non-faulty. It has to recall all its P4 chips and uh, uh, it lost a good amount of money. So this is another hardware error, right? Not a software error, hardware error. So formal methods can detect race conditions very well. Formal methods can detect, this is basically some problem with accessing a shared variable memory location. Can detect such errors very well. Formal methods can detect hardware errors very well, right? Uh, they are very good at detecting these. So again, there's no need to motivate this. We know that software controls many safety critical systems. All these are controlled by software. And if there is an uh, error, we know that it's, it's either uh, critical to life or there is a lot of financial loss. So the need for reliable hardware and software is very uh, important and the most of these don't work like a Microsoft window. You know, if, if you have a problem with your Microsoft Windows operating system, the default thing that we all do is shut it down and restart and everything will magically work fine. You can't shut down an autopilot while it's flying a plane. You can't shut down uh, you know, altitude calculating software while it's flying a rocket. All these things are not possible. So that's what the point is. It's not feasible to shut down a malfunctioning system and say, I will restore safety. Not possible, right? It's already done the error before you realize it's passed on too expensive, right? Uh, so we're dependent on systems for continuous function. We call such systems as reactive systems in formal methods. So they are supposed to be up and about forever, not like normal programs which, like for example, Citibank Online is up and about, right? If Citibank has to do maintenance, they send you messages saying, see, we are doing maintenance, expect a slowdown for two hours. Citibank cannot afford to say we're doing maintenance, so my services will not be available for 10 hours. They'll be penalized, right? Uh, so you can't shut down. They have to be continuously working, reactive in nature. And so it's important to develop methods that increase our confidence in the correctness of such safety critical systems. So typically, whatever software we write and whichever agile methodology, the, whatever it is, they all follow some order or the other, right? Uh, this is a classical waterfall model of software development. So initially, you have some clarity on for what you're writing your software for. So those are requirements. And then you design your software, whatever it is, hardware, software, systems design. Then a team of people sit and write code. Then they test. And once it's tested, software is released and maintained, and then you can go whenever you want to add some functionality, you can go and repeat and all that stuff, right? Uh, so any thoughts on uh, where, uh, okay, before I ask the question, maybe we'll move on. So typically formal methods or testing is uh, strength is to detect errors, right? Uh, so errors could come in various uh, phases. So let's say somebody, a programmer, uh, inadvertently, hopefully not purposely, inserted an error while coding, right? Didn't know it happened. But uh, let's say it was found either during unit testing by the programmer himself or it was found during testing, which comes immediately after coding. Then it's fine because you found it well and good, no problem, not too expensive. Let's say there was an error while designing the system. Somebody made an error while, you know, designing you, you you, you made a mistake. You say that this this two uh, will uh, write using shared variable, and as you saw, no, some amount of space allotted. Some mistake you made, right? If you find the error, so if you've designed and uh, if you didn't find the error then and there, then the erroneous design gets implemented, and then let's say hopefully during testing somebody finds the error. So it's slightly more expensive to fix it because somebody has to go and redesign. So first of all, it's very difficult to find what was the source of the error. Was the error did the error happen in design? Did the error happen because of coding? The, these problems are, are called fault isolation problems. These are difficult problems. So suppose you do that. So you have to redesign, then recode, and then test again. 
But imagine if the error was found during requirements. Somebody just got the requirements wrong. Two requirements in a long document were inconsistent. One contradicted the other. Nobody found it. So people went, designed for it, they wrote code for it, and then they found it during testing. The cost to fix that error is even more expensive, right? Because you have to first of all find out that the error was because of buggy requirements. Then you have to go and find out who wrote the design, which part of the design correspond to those buggy requirements, how to make changes, make changes in the design, recode, and then test again, right? Uh, so errors in software development lifecycle, which is the focus of formal verification, can happen anywhere, right? Uh, so typically, the Pareto rule applies for software development lifecycle. These are empirical studies. They say 50% of the errors are introduced during programming, and many errors are detected during testing phase. But the thing to note is that the earlier an error is found, the better it is. That's what I told you, right? Uh, so studies have shown that the cost of repairing a software error after the software is released is roughly 500 times higher than when you find it before release. And uh, ideally, as you go down the development, you believe that uh, defects should decrease, right? Uh, so let's look at uh, what can we do. So the idea is don't insert errors here, don't insert errors here, don't insert errors here. If by mistake they get in, find them all here before you go here. That's the goal we are working towards, right? Uh, but uh, it's not, this is the ideal world. We don't live in an ideal world. So errors could get in here, could get in here, could get in here, and uh, hopefully it will be found. A classical testing, as we all do, we'll come back and see, is very good in finding these kinds of errors. Somebody starts array indexing from zero instead of one or the other way around. You know, uh, somebody puts a less than or equal to instead of less than. Testing can very fast find these errors, really fast. Somebody does a division by zero. We are very capable of finding these errors. But it's very difficult to find errors in requirements and design. And once you find them here, first of all, it's difficult. But if you find them here, it's a little late because it's expensive to fix in software engineering. So we would like to have methods that find errors that creep in in requirements and design right there before you code, right? You're able to understand before you get into coding. So formal methods is all about that. It's about developing mathematical techniques that would find errors that creep in here or here before you begin coding, right? And the kind of formal models that we have can very nicely model the kind of software that we talked about embedded software and uh, the problems have tractable algorithms but the kind of software that talks about gaming and uh, enterprise and web application software their uh, formal methods techniques are typically intractable or undecidable by intractable what i mean is it's at least np complete in fact it's at least p space complete or harder or undecidable. It's not even NP complete. That, that's the kind of problems we're talking about. So we'll first look at specification and see what kind of errors described. So this is just to formally introduce what a specification is. So a specification, basically we all know, defines a list of requirements or properties of the system or the product that is being designed. So here is an example of a specification. So you might want, you might have a requirement which says that whenever there's a request from a client, server responds to that request within three seconds. Three seconds is usually too much. You usually have in milliseconds or microseconds. And then something like users should have mutually exclusive access to the printer. I give print, Professor Vivek Srinivas also give print to the same print network printer. We take it for granted that it'll either print mine followed by his based on the order. But it just so happens that we give print exactly at the same time, which is highly likely because 45 of us use two network printers. It should not print one page of mine, one page of his, right? Uh, so there is a network software that ensures mutually exclusive access to the printer. So we take these things for granted, but they have to be specified and verified. So specification basically describes what a system has to do. And if I find a defect, it means that one of the requirements is not met. I think somebody said the same thing when we began the lecture, right? Uh, so typically, how do people ensure uh, uh, that uh, system specification is set. The most popular technique which uh, everybody who has written code will know is that of testing, software testing. So we will uh, very soon see what is software testing and wh what is formal methods and how is it different from software testing. 
So the other technique that we all know, uh, don't know, we may not know about till you've worked in a company that's of a decent size is companies have something called peer reviews. So as the term says, there is somebody who's your peer, who's your colleague, who sits and reads your code. So it might sound very funny, but it happens and it's a very important part. Uh, there is a name for it called Fagan Inspection. And there are people who are paid to do these jobs. They're called software quality auditors, SQAs or QAs. So their job is basically to read your code and inspect and see if it is fine. And it's supposed to be very effective in the sense that it's supposed to find a lot of errors. Codes are typically, you know, typical, I don't know if you, have, uh, go, you can go back and Google for it. What do you think will be the number of lines of code in a Swift Desire car that has uh, the uh, airbag feature? Any idea? Just the airbag. Or power window, power window, you know, right? You press the driver, that the driver seat presses, this just goes up in a glass. And let's say if it's a good car, then if a child puts the hand, it will stop. It will not go, right? Uh, that's also software. So how many lines of code, if you put together all these odd functionalities that are non-mechanical, non-electrical in nature in a car, something like a Swift car will have a few million lines of code with all these functionalities. So it's not physically <laughs> possible to go through the code. So they use tools that will help them to go through the code faster, but they still go through the code. And this is a very popular verification technique, not a formal verification technique, but a verification technique. They are called peer reviews, and it's a must do in any large organization. So the next popular verification technique that we all know is testing, right? Uh, can somebody tell me what testing does? What do you do when you test your software? It could be something that you've done for your course project. It could be something, but what do you, how do you test a software? Any thoughts? Yeah, provide a set of inputs. Yeah, so provide a set of inputs is correct. So for <coughs> outputs, you use the particular word called expected output. You said just output. Somebody else said something here. Yeah so, yeah, so results are known from before and uh, we give inputs. So let's elaborate on a bit. So providing inputs to test the software is something that we all know. So suppose I provide inputs, I test a software. We've come to how to test it. How do you know whether you found an error or not? Any thoughts? Which is not expected. Which is not expected, yeah. Sorry? Yeah, so while testing, there are two things that are important. Providing inputs. You provide inputs, you run your software. After that, what do I do? Software produces output. By looking at the output, how do I know whether I have found an error or not? I know because I was expecting a certain kind of output. If the software produces the same output as what I had expected it to produce, then I know that there is no error. But if a software produces an output different from what I had expected it to produce, then I know that there is an error. So testing usually has two things. It has inputs to the software and it always has expected output. If you just have inputs, you will never know <laughs> what to do when the software produces the output. So you should know here is the input and for my software to work correctly, here is the expected output, right? Uh, so you give these two things. And then that's what is written here. So you provide a sequence of inputs. In testing jargon, we call them tests, test cases, test data, whatever you want to call it. Output is generated after execution. You compare it to expected outputs. Expected outputs are always given by what you, what you have specified, by your requirements. Error is detected if there is a mismatch. So most popular verification technique, you can never replace <coughs> testing. It's very important. Somebody like Bill Gates, you can Google for it. There's a popular statement here where he says, 55% of Microsoft's engineers do testing in some form of the other, other right? Uh, so the, everybody has to test. And if these days companies follow agile methodology, so earlier times, 10 years ago, there was this niche job. I'm a developer. He's a tester because it's like a look down upon job. There's nothing like that now because of agile. Every developer has to test. There is no other uh, thing, right? So what are the advantages of testing? It's relatively well practiced. Many popular techniques and tools are available. Testing relies on tools to do the execution and all. Do you, have you heard of any tools? <coughs> Sorry? Selenium. Selenium, yes. Anything else? 
J unit. J unit. Yeah. So J for Java, U unit for unit testing. So there is also something for C for every every programming language you can think of. There'll be a unit attached to that. Selenium is like uh, they all have web interfaces. They can. So what they do is they help you to automate testing. Right. Test case design is on us. So there are lots of tools and it checks many uh, aspects of software. And the nice thing is that it's applicable to all software. There is nothing like there is a software. I have developed a great software for which that I can't be tested. <laughs> that claim doesn't make sense, right? Uh, so it's, you can test any kind of software. But what are the disadvantages of testing? So the first disadvantage to be noted is exhaustive testing is not possible. Can somebody help me to understand that statement? Any thoughts? Yeah, highly improbable to check every single, every possible single outcome of the software. Yeah, any other answers? Complete coverage is not possible. Yeah. Very expensive in what sense? Time or? Uh, yeah, yeah, you had. Does not provide us the absence of errors. Any other statement? Huh? Yeah, it might need a lot of RAM, so the expensive part can go with that also. Yes, it is true. Any other answers? Yes, that's also a valid point. So, let's say I have an autopilot software. I claim that I have this great autopilot software. How will you test? You need a plane to run it on. If you have to do system testing, right? Uh, it's not going to be easy to get a simulator for a plane, right? Uh, in Bangalore, it's relatively easy. You can at least see a simulator because there is an aero show that happens. But in other cities, it's even more difficult to even see a simulator. So anyway, so exhaustive testing is not possible. I hope everybody is able to appreciate the system. Let's take a small example. Let's say you have a program with two integer variables. Whatever the program is, it just has two integer variables, right? And you're running that program on a not a very big processor, 64-bit processor. How many different values are there? If you have to do exhaustive testing, how many different values uh, that you can provide for these integer inputs? 2 power 64 minus 2 power 64 to plus or minus 1 to 2 power 64 minus 1, right? So let's say you have this super test case execution tool that one, one integer you provide, it will give you it will run the program like magic and give you the results in one second. Even then, to do exhaustive testing, you will spend a lot of time, right? And it's useless <laughs> in the sense that you may not, and this is only for integers. You can imagine if it has floating point numbers, if it has arrays, if it has files, if it has lists, you know, it's not going to be possible. And the other thing is it's not necessary. So because it's not going to be possible and it's not necessary, the second point becomes important. Testing can detect bug if it's present, but using testing, you cannot prove that my software is free of bugs, right? You can never say, see, I have this program. It's a fairly large program. Doesn't matter. My colleague here executed only 100 test cases, but I have executed 100,000 test cases. Here, see, it's proved to be bug free. It's a wrong statement to make. What about the test cases on which you haven't executed it on? Are you guaranteed that it will work correct? You're not because you've not executed it on it, right? So you can't guarantee that it'll work, right? So this is a very famous statement made by this person called Ed Edgar Dijkstra. I don't know if you know Dijkstra, if you've heard of him. So this is Dijkstra's quote. So he says, testing is useless. Don't go chasing testing because it can only detect the presence of bugs. It cannot prove an absence. Ideally, in the idealistic software development world, I want a methodology that if given my software, to be able to come with a proof that it works. That's, a, that's what an ideal mathematician would desire, right? So Dijkstra says that till we reach there, we've probably not done enough computer science, right? So he, he's, this is his quote, right? And the other thing is that testing is typically not adequate for safety critical systems. The chances of finding an error uh, is slightly higher for safety critical systems and uh, a big deal of thing happens, right? Uh, why is it not adequate? Because safety critical systems are typically distributed or concurrent systems. So chances of race conditions, things like that, which are very difficult kind of errors to find using testing, creep in faster than uh, other kinds of systems. 
so it is typically not adequate see i am by no means uh, so testing cannot can never be removed it's very important very very useful and 90% of the not 90 99.9% of the software that we work on works fine right we work with works fine purely based on testing so it i'm not by any way trying to i'm just trying to motivate forward methods so it, it's not meant to replace testing it's just meant to act complementary to testing so don't, don't take these terms as being against testing we can't do without <coughs> testing right uh, so the other popular technique that people do mainly for hardware verification and system verification is simulink simulink typically the kind of classical things that we know are you uh, you must have heard of these terms vhdl verilog they are basically hardware description languages that they let you work with circuits and you can run simulations and check if the software is working fine if you extend this you can even simulate like for example if you have an autopilot you can get a flight simulator and run your autopilot on that simulator to see if it's fine so you're still not risking uh, and it's done similarly cars also they they have these simulators on which you can test they very high niche systems that provide all functionalities of the same software that is going to be running but you know mock setup that doesn't cost anything to life in fact the biggest uh, car simulator any guess on where you will find it which company will have it tesla, tesla. <laughs> right because i mean it's his goal right to so it was recently in the news but yeah yeah but they do have very sophisticated uh, simulators extremely sophisticated simulators i mean it's a pleasure to work with those kinds of systems right google and tesla both of them have because they 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 have that ambitious goal of doing autonomous cars and all that right so simulation is a big thing so just to recap typically we are interested in verification three kinds of verification happen somebody sits and goes through your code called peer review testing which we are familiar with and simulation right so formal methods is the fourth kind of verification right which is not any of these three uh, closely related to testing and simulation but it's still the fourth kind right so what happens in formal verification so it's just a technique that you can use to construct systems that operate reliably as i told you it's meant to be complementary to testing and simulation to be used along with testing and simulation never meant to replace testing and simulation right uh, they have to exist so the word formal verification says it's based on formal methods read formal methods as basically some discrete math model we are not even interested in continuous maths we don't know how to do it so discrete math model basically means partial orders lattices uh, some logic uh, finite state automata push down automata those are the kinds of models we are talking about right the models that we are not talking about are differential equations this markov decision processes uh, neural networks we're not talking about any of those kinds of models this elementary discrete math kind of models so those are the mathematically based languages we have a set of techniques that uh, you will see you will get a introduction to two kinds of techniques and obviously some tools that implement these techniques that help you to do formal methods so we typically what we do is we specify a system and then we verify a system specifying a system means you take a language a formal language and write down the requirements of a system in the formal language typically the kind of documents that you will get as specifications are english documents you'll get a word document or a pdf file which says thou shall not do this you must do this if you do this you'll do this like that it'll be written but uh, because we are interested in formal methods we can't start with Uh, english language so we like to start with a formal language so we want to write the specifications in formal language we want to write it using notations of set theory and logic and then because we are writing down our requirements in a formal language we'll model the system also in a formal language right uh, we won't like class diagrams or automata drawn in rational row row suite or you know those are not models for us uml models are not mathematical enough for us we need slightly more mathematical models and once you have these two models a specification written not in english but in a suitable mathematical language a system model in another suitable mathematical language then we verify so verification is proving formally that the system meets requirements so this formally could just be a pen and paper proof somebody takes 
this one it's written in math right some logic this could be written in as an automaton or some other logic so you do a derivation or a proof using the known proof techniques using pen and paper and you can prove that my software works fine right the oldest techniques that were used to do proofs by hand were developed by two three people tony hoare edgar dijkstra and uh, dana scott so all three of them got turing awards to do pen and paper proofs to develop methodology to write pen and paper proofs to prove programs correct not to test programs sir so tony hoare is still alive works for microsoft research he has an honorary position at microsoft research and uh, apparently responds to emails if you write to him asking for doubts and all that stuff right uh, so we can't we are not sir tony hoare and edgar dijkstra because we don't have the knowledge of mathematics to all the time take our software and develop techniques to write pen and paper proofs so the style these days this was done in 50s and 60s by all these people so the style these days is i'll write a tool that will prove do the proof for you right uh, so what we are interested in in understanding the methodologies that will help us to write tools once you write a tool you need a set of algorithms to do formal verification so what are the algorithms what are the tools that are available that's that's what we are going to see right so we'll look at these steps one after the other specifying verifying so we'll just look at specification understand at a high level how specification is done using mathematical language so specification is the process of describing a system and its desired properties as i told you we are not looking at writing a system and its properties in english we are looking at writing a system and its properties in a mathematical language so what are the kinds of various properties that you could write here is some kind of a classification so if you just read through it it says the first one is called functional requirements so it says the system should never hang it's very high level but it's still written and then every request from a client should be followed by a response from the server within a specified time so this could be another kind of properties the second kind of properties are called structural properties it says the system should have a main and a backup server like for example if you see aircraft uh, an ordinary aircraft how many engines do you see in an aircraft any idea in a big aircraft four but let's say if you're flying from Mang bangalore to mangalore two then eight yes so even no aircraft will fly with one one engine maybe a helicopter will but uh, they always need a backup because if one engine fails typically one engine is enough to fly an a380 or a boeing 7787 but you a380 will fly with six engines because it will never take a chance right uh, so there's always a main and a backup this is a requirement you know somebody has to specify it otherwise people will not develop planes with two engines they will develop planes with only one engine somebody has to say please have two engines right and then uh, somebody should say you know these advertisements that come uh my phone is so thin they they put the picture like this showing how thin the phone is right my laptop is so thin that's also a requirement right because somebody has to say there is a market for phones that are thin there is a market for lightweight laptops that's a requirement right the third kind of requirements are little more technical it says that stock market status screen should be refreshed every 3 seconds or something like that or on the day when the quarter quarter updates come from these it companies maybe the stock market screen should be refreshed every 1 second because the stocks might change a lot and then something like receipt of a message should be acknowledged within 10 seconds and all. so now it should not be very difficult to see uh, first what about the second one do you think it can be tested or verified or it can it be subject to anything that computer science has got to do with like testing or verification the second kind of requirements it's nothing right i mean you can't test for these kinds of requirements you can't you somebody can take a tape and maybe <laughs> measure whether the screen is so thick or something but clearly those are not the kind of requirements we're talking about you are able to understand we we're not interested but they do people do write them down we are interested in the first and in the kind of requirements of the third kind we are interested in both these kinds of requirements functional requirements functional requirements that have timing kind of constraints we are not interested in these kinds of requirements so we use mathematical languages to write these these but not these kinds of requirements right uh, so the mathematical languages are very complex i may not be able to introduce you to all of them tomorrow i will introduce you to one language called ctl but this is just to give you an example of the kinds of languages that uh, have happened in the past these are some popular examples so uh there is something called tcas uh, this i don't know how to uh, so tcas is like uh, so in 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 uh, in the air 
the there is a, not in Bangalore's roads, but in air there is a problem of traffic collision. Uh, so TCAS is a system that avoids air collision, mid-air collision by keeping a minimum separation distance between aircrafts. So typically, a company like uh, Honeywell or General Elective will uh, will develop a TCAS system that will run in a network of aircrafts within an ATC. So TCAS was specified using something called state charts. You might have heard state charts, UML language state charts. So it has formal semantics. It works like a lot like state machine. So this was done uh, using state charts and uh, about 55% of the original set of requirements were found to be bad requirements. So just by writing it down in a formal language, they were able to prove this. And now they have developed algorithms for automatically checking consistency and completeness of requirements. This is another popular example. It's slightly old, but it's still useful. IBM has this uh, CICS, Customer Information Control System. Oxford University in the UK used a specification language called Z. Z is a language uh, that's based on set theory and first order logic to formally specify this. And IBM estimated a 9% decrease. And this is just to what I'm talking about is, if you go back in the development life cycle, what I'm talking about is this, instead of writing it in English, functional requirements, write it in a mathematical language. That's all we're talking about. So by doing that, you can save a lot, find a lot of errors. These are examples of that kinds of exercise. I'm just giving you two examples. There are many more of them, right? Uh, so the next step to verification is, uh, uh, specification is verification. Verification involves actually, I told you, right, proving, coming up with a proof that a system will meet a requirement. There are several proof techniques. One is by hand. As I told you, this was developed by two, three people, very old, still being practiced. But uh, somebody takes and does a pen and paper proof. They just prove it by hand. It's not difficult to do. It's like proving correctness of your algorithm. I have an algorithm to do merge sort. I <coughs> prove that it's correct, right? Uh, those, there are some second year students, second to third year students, they'll understand the pain of doing proofs. But this is exactly that proof, by hand proof, right? Instead of writing it in English, you write it in logic, can do by hand. And then there's something called semi-automated. As the word says, it's partly automated. User gives parts of it. Parts of it are run by an, al verified by an algorithm running on a computer. These things are done by tools called theorem provers. Theorem provers. So the name itself might sound funny, but it prove, it's a tool that does proving of a theorem. You're able to understand, it tries to prove a theorem. The most popular theorem provers are uh, B method, Z is also a theorem prover. So lots of theorem provers uh, are in use. Then uh, the next is fully automated, where the proof is done entirely by a tool that implements an algorithm. So there are two techniques for that. One is called model checking. Right, uh, just a digression because it's post lunch. So typically, most of these companies, uh, including Triple ID, have this thing of you know what you're allowed to access and what you're not allowed to access. And when I type model checking, half the time it comes up saying that you know you're forbidden access because it thinks that I'm looking at fashion models and and checking out on them. Right, so it is checking of a formal model. Right. Uh, so you can try it out, don't be too surprised, the triple IT does throw up once in a while saying that you're forbidden access. So this is checking of a formal model. These are theorem provers. And there's something called program analysis, which Professor Raghavan will tell you about. So this can be done by hand, program analysis. This can be fully automated also. So it falls into two buckets, right? Uh, so this course, we will do model checking a bit and uh, program analysis a bit. Uh, no theorem provers, just the tip of model checking and uh, the most elementary results in model checking and the most elementary results in program analysis is what I'll tell you about. So we'll do model checking first. So model checking, this uh, typically system design is usually modeled as a finite state automaton. Finite state transition system I've written. But if you know finite state automata, it's the same thing. Just remove the set of final states and uh, you'll get a transition system out of it. Specification is written in, as a formula in some appropriate logic. Most of you would have studied uh, Boolean logic or propositional logic, as you would call it. But we pre pre uh, typically prefer to write specifications in uh, what we call temporal logic or uh, first order logic. So I'll introduce you to a temporal logic tomorrow. So model checking is fully automatic. So once you give it a finite state automaton and a temporal logic specification, it will exhaustively check, verify, 
and uh, tell you that whether the specification is met by the system or not. There are several open source tools that are available and uh, so input is a system model or a specification. Output is usually yes, the system meets the specification or a no if the system doesn't meet its specification. So if the output is a no, model checkers also give you a witness. The main reason for this is that let's say you're testing, you're verifying, it doesn't matter, formally verifying. But suppose the tester comes back or a verifier comes back to you and says, yeah, yeah, your code is good, your system's fine, all the requirements are met, don't worry. You're usually happy and go. But if the tester or the verifier comes back and says, see, your system or your code doesn't satisfy this requirement. Typically, as a developer, your designer, your next question is why? How do you know? Can you give me a proof? My code is correct. This is how you argue, right? So the job of a model checker is also to give you a witness. To say here is why it doesn't meet the uh, specification, right? Uh, so whenever it says no, it gives you a counter example. Counter example is a concrete run or an execution of a system that violates the requirement. Model checkers do these things automatically, right? So this is how the model checker process will go like. So you, I have a requirement, I formalize it, write it in a mathematical language, I have a system. Here, read system as finite state safety critical systems, like I told you, right? Like examples, so not every kind of system, right? There's only certain kinds of systems. Then I model it, I get a system model, I give it to a tool, it'll say yes, everything's fine, I stop. Or it'll say no, then it'll give me a witness. So I have to understand the witness, the system run. So I go ahead and simulate, I understand what the error is, then I could make changes and repeat the process. This is how model checking works, right? Uh, some, so, so model checking got, so as I told you, uh, by hand verification has got three Turing awards. Turing award is the highest award in computer science. Model checking has got three Turing awards, but it was shared in one year, in the year 2008. Uh, Ed Clerk, Joseph Sifakis, and uh, one more, at Clark at Carnegie Mellon and uh, just they got the Turing Award for developing the first uh, model checking techniques. So here are some popular examples. AT&T applied model checking where about 7,500 lines was verified against 145 requirements and so many errors were found. This is a popular, used to be an old popular, uh, this, this, this particular example was done quite old, quite some time ago, 1992 a team from Carnegie Mellon applied model checking to the IEEE protocol and found errors in the IEEE protocol. Part of the reasons why they got the Turing Award in 2008 was this work they did in 1992, right? Uh, where it was used to find errors in an IEEE standard. So how does it compare to testing? As I told you, it is usually applied on design, whereas testing is typically done on code. We don't take the code when we do model checking. And uh, let's say it behaves like this. So these are your erroneous states. Using testing, you can you, your test cases might cover these kinds of paths, these kinds of paths, these kinds of paths, but they might still miss out their error state, state because exhaustively I can't uh, test. Whereas what model checking guarantees is model checking guarantees exhaustive checking, but it can't scale up to all software, all kinds of code. It can work with a certain level of abstraction for what are called finite state systems. So as I told you, I can't formally verify an enterprise software, but I can verify the critical functionalities of a brake by wire system. I can verify that a Mars Land Rover will accurately land within a certain amount of time. You know, I can do these kinds of things, but uh, I can't randomly verify any kind of software with that. So here is a, a small example again to sort of motivate the kind of systems that we will be looking at. A large class of systems for which model checking applies are concurrent systems. Concurrent, you think of it as many processes are running, right? Here is a small example of a code. It's a concurrent program. There are three processes that run. One is an increment process, one is a decrement process, and one is a reset process. So all three of them work on one global variable called X. It's just a toy piece of code. So what does increment do? So read this as it's an infinite loop forever, right? So don't worry about what is this, is it realistic and all. We're just trying to motivate, right? Read while true as run forever. 
what do you do? You check if this <coughs> single global variable x is less than 200, then you increment it by 1. What does decrement do? As long as x is non-zero, decrement it by 1. What does reset do? If x reaches 200, reset it to 0. Is it clear? So there are three processes. There is some scheduler that schedules these three processes in some order. Any order. It could be round robin, it could be something. Right? Uh, so the question is this. Can you show that x will never, will always be between 0 and 200? Is the requirement clear? Will x be always between 0 and 200? This is what I want to show. So I'll put the code. So can you give a proof argument orally that x will always be between 0 and 200? Any thoughts? Yeah, so it, it, yeah, yeah, so I, yeah, just sorry, one second. So here is the first proof attempt to show that this invariant is correct, will be true. So it says that, so the proof strategy that she used, which seems valid, is that take independently each of them. So this is anyway not going to let x touch 200. This is independent of whether x is 200 or not. Hopefully, this process will ensure that. And this is, the moment it does 200, it's going to make it something really small. Right? Uh, so, it could be true. Yeah, you had something? We could, take, we could just take the boundary and evaluate the whole expression on 0 and on 200. Okay. So yeah, so the other proof argument that is being suggested is that, you know, it's okay to, don't worry about x for 17, x for 144, it should be fine because one of them will do something. Let's only focus on the boundary because that's when it matters. If x is 0 and when x is 200. So can we argue only by relying on the boundary that x will always be between 0 and 200? It will never become minus 1, it will never become 201. Any other, yeah. Concurrent and X is a, yeah, so it's a concurrent program, just to, yeah. We can say that X is a second program, check the condition, and before it decrements, this one goes beyond 200, Yeah, so it's a concurrent program, X is a global variable. I got one answer. Anybody else? Yeah. So, yeah, one argument you could say is the only initial values of X that are important are 0 and 200. Maybe if it is anything else, it will probably be all right. But uh, can you give a proof independent? So actually for many proofs, the initial value is indeed important. So maybe without loss of generality here, you can assume that x is 0. Will it still be all right? Yeah, yeah. We'll take it one at a time. Yeah. Why will all possible permutations be 6? Yeah, no, but it will still not be 6. No? Permutations meaning? No, it can go on. So, x is in a global memory location. Yeah, I'm saying only if you consider one, all the six arrangements, then if you Why? How six arrangements? I don't get that. Oh, no, only these three. I'm not talking about the infinite case. I'm talking about only these three. You arrange and all those Only, I'm not considering that. So, what you're saying is increment will run first, decrement will run first, reset will run like that. Ah, okay. Okay, yeah. 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 Okay, so everybody is trying to prove that uh, the invariant is true? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's exactly what was suggested there. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, so several proof techniques. One is partition into three parts, consider all possible interleavings, yeah. Yeah, hold on, I'll come back. Yeah, so the answer was there is a race condition. That is, uh, so what is the race condition we'll have to understand, yeah. 
If the initial value of x is more than 200, then what will happen? None of these will be able to run. It will get stuck maybe. Oh, second one will run. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Yeah, so that, that's why that other observation is also important. It depends on what the initial value of x is. So you can assume that it's 0 or some value less than 200. Then will it be true? So many of you, so in fact, a good number of you suggested the way we model and proof. Model each one as a transition system, take all possible interleavings, take all possible orderings in which processes can occur, and then prove, right? These are proof techniques that we do to model check. No matter what proof technique you do, this property is not true. So two people gave answers, right? Uh, uh, yours is fully correct, so I'll come back. Yours is also correct. Can you elaborate on what we mean by race condition? What What is the race condition here? Like that. Yeah. So can you can you give me one sequence where x will violate one of these values? So this property is not true. I'm telling everybody <laughs> that. Can you tell me one sequence where it will violate? X is a global variable. These are concurrent processes. Yeah. Like, no, what do we mean by concurrently? There is a, so start with some value of x which makes you suspect that the problem is false. This initial value, that's a very important question. Give me initial value where, or a value for x and a sequence of calling of increment, decrement and reset which will make it flip above 200 or below 0. If you start with 200. X is greater than 0. Yeah. And then if, we, if it's concurrent, so if the next statement, uh, these two statements attribute of x is equal to 200 and x is equal to 0, and then it goes back to the previous one and x is equal to x minus 1, so it goes minus 1. Huh. So, yeah, she got it. So, you also got the answer. Can anybody else uh, attempt? So, take x is equal to 200. How many conditions will ho be true in this case? Which processes will pass their conditions? Second and third will pass. So both ready to begin. My condition is true. My condition is also true. Each process will think that way. Right? Uh, both processes will pass the condition. Now can you tell me which execution will cause violation? So you are able to understand what I am saying. Suppose x is 200. Process decrement tests the value of x, passes it. Right? So before de so decrement passes it, it's happy in some sense that it's passed. But before it could do this, x is a global variable. Reset is also happy that its condition passed, right? So reset tests the value of x, passes the test, resets it to 0. Before decrement could do. It's fast. It got priority by the scheduler. Something happened, right? Uh, so control is returned to process decrement. Decrement still thinks my conditions passed, right? So it will make it minus one. You are able to understand what I am saying. This is one such scenario. Now you you'll be able to use this and you can come up with. Uh, so the problem is what is called race condition. There is a race between decrement and reset. Nobody is there to tell the processes that if your conditions are true, <coughs> you wait till the other one finishes, right? Uh, you're able to understand. Obviously, this uh, is not really... So, model checking is very good in finding these kinds of errors, which human beings might tend to miss, right? And typically, the kind of proof techniques that model checkers use was, in fact, orally told by all of you. There is a model that is constructed. There is a graph model, somebody said, that's constructed of this, this, and this. Then you construct what is called a global graph model that tells you all possible ways in which they could interleave and execute for all possible ordering of execution of the processes. And then in that global graph model, if I can find a path from the initial state to a state where x takes the value minus 1 or 201, then I have violated. If I can find no path from the initial state to the state for all possible interleavings, then I have not violated. This is precisely the model checking algorithm. The graph models that we are talking about are large finite state automata, 
right this is this is a very toy program you're not going to get anything something like this for real verification so they are large finite state automata 100000 states so you have to construct what is called the global graph which is a larger finite state automata and run the search the most elementary way of searching through a graph is do you know an algorithm to search through a graph bfs or dfs so in model checking we call these as explicit state searches we are very happy when we do dfs and bfs because they are linear time you know i mean they are good algorithms they are not np complete problems but linear time is bad if you have a graph that has a few hundred thousand nodes because the dfs runs on ram not in the hard disk right the 100000 node is a very small graph i'm talking about something like 2 per 100 nodes it's very common to find these kinds of graphs in formal methods so we don't do explicit state search like dfs or bfs we have very niche search algorithms called symbolic search algorithms which basically generate very succinct binary data structures from graphs called binary decision diagrams and then search through them right so those algorithms were developed at carnegie mellon and part of the reasons why the team got the turing award is to do better than just dfs or bfs right uh, so this is how model checking works they take these programs they generate graphs called finite state machines and then they basically search through the graph the question is the very first model checkers which were developed by uh, bell labs it's called spin it used to do dfs and bfs very cleverly it used to keep only as much of the graph that it needs they are called on the fly it still can't scale up to 2 per 100 and beyond so later on 2 per 100 is a, still a very small model if you have a hardware circuit with 100 variables you're talking about state space of 200 right because each bit can each variable can take zero or one right uh, so later they develop very niche search techniques but in fact the things that you orally said they are theoretically formalized and that's how model checking works program analysis instead of doing graphs that's it as lattices <coughs> which are even more succinct models and you can do some kind of fixed point computations and lattices to be able to do these kinds of searches right uh, yeah so this is uh, i need not even go through it so there is a belief that oh my god there's so much of math in it so only mathematicians can do formal methods it's true to a certain extent that an ordinary software engineer cannot do formal methods because he or she may not know these search and modeling techniques and all that stuff but there are tools that assist you and the other thing that's important is that the search is done by a tool right you have to understand the thing that i'm talking about the, what the tool is written in c maybe so what is that's also a program so what if that program has an error what if that tool has an error it makes a mistake in its search these kinds of questions naturally arise right? we live with it that's all right you know it could be the case that the tool that you use for formal methods has an error let it be people will sooner or later find it right uh, we can't do anything using formal methods will slow down the project because there's so much extra work this is what corporates think yes but it will speed up once the errors are found so you know you just live with these kinds of things what are the benefits the benefits are usually of product focus as i told you these apply to a very niche class of systems so we focused on products we are not generally talking about agile xp we're not talking anything like that uh, it's a technique that applies to a product focused way and uh, yeah you typically de de detect defects early as i told you because we have design models before you code so it helps in reducing errors and uh, you guarantee correctness unlike testing formal verification is assured to explore all possible execution paths however big the graph is so will find violating behavior if it exists so the dijkstra statement it will prove absence of errors right whereas testing will detect only presence of errors formal methods can be used to do what if complexity it has a sound mathematical underpinning and <clears throat> it's been enjoying rapidly increasing in interest by industry because there are several companies that sell model checking tools several others have built in house verification tools if you're working in the safety critical domain you would be aware of uh, these kinds of tools few of our students and in iit have got placed in companies like mathworks which uh, develops a formal methods tool uh, few uh, in fact as a, a, a student who is going to graduate in the coming batch is also going to join mathworks right so they do develop formal methods program analysis kinds of tools right so what are the weaknesses of formal methods it is appropriate as i told you only for what we call control intensive applications where there is a lot of control not for data intensive applications i can't use it for enterprise software that works on a large database or graphics 
it's not meant for that because those state machines are beyond the size that can be handled by any realistic tool or supercomputer typically verifies a system model or a design doesn't verify the actual system so it's a mathematical model there could be errors because you could have done the mathematical modeling wrongly it's a problem there yeah it, theoretically it has restrictions so for those of you who know a bit of algorithms and complexity theory the lowest complexity class in in model checking that we are talking about is what's called p space polynomial space which is above np complete so any algorithms person would consider np complete as the limit of intractability professor murli's lecture on approximation algorithms will tell you how to overcome np complete hardness but we are talking about p space complete problems or undecidable or exp time kinds of problems that's the complexity measure so a lot of problems are undecidable so we have to abstract get into the decidable domain and then do model checking right uh, and uh, it suffers from state space explosion problem as i told you we typically even for it's a p space complete problem so it takes polynomial space so even for normal systems you suffer from lack of computer memory right uh, and as i told you this is a just tool it's written by somebody in a language it just implements a set of algorithms that itself can have errors uh, it has been found twice in the past that a model checker tool there's a tool called prism probabilistic model checker that was developed by oopsla university prism implementation had an error so there was no point at that time in using prism to say see i modeled it in some that system didn't have an error right because the, not only the implementation of the tool the, one of the algorithms that prism was using had a problem right uh, so these problem we live with these kinds of problems right uh, so this is very important again if you're working in the software uh, uh, a safety critical industry so typically if you work in a domain where you say that i have developed this autopilot software or i have this radiation machine and all you can't just like that take it to market you're subject to a lot of regulations and and things like that uh, so regulations are basically standards that tell you whether your software is market ready worthy so if it's avionics software then uh, there is something called federal aviation administration in the us and uh, dgca here director general of civil aviation who tells you whether a particular software is flight worthy or not it's safe or not for passenger aircraft similarly for military aircraft similarly for cars so these are some names that you might encounter this do 178b 178c 278 don't worry if you don't know them these are just names of standards the most common standard that you will see in your uh, the, the things like this also there is isi here there is one more fss say ai something that is there then in toys you will see ce i don't know if you have noted that blunt c and blunt e that means conformity to european so it says almost all of them will say banned for 0 to 36 months i don't know if you have looked at it uh, because it will have some kind of plastic so these are regulation standards similarly for say, uh, for software that safety critical these are the standards that apply iso ic do and all that and almost all these standards mandate using formal methods so unless one is working in an industry that uses these the likelihood of you appreciating formal methods might be very less because if you're working in any of these and like for example if uh, city bank develops a new feature it doesn't have to go through these because that's not a safety critical software right uh, whereas others have to go through so formal methods is typically used in industries that target safety critical software so that was an introduction to formal methods i still have about 20 minutes so i'll begin with one of the notations for formal modeling so what we call transition systems and program graphs as i told you the first step in model checking so tomorrow i'll talk about writing specifications first step is to model the specification but i am doing the modeling the system so transition systems are a standard model to represent hardware and software systems they represent a behavior of a system if you know a finite state automaton you know this otherwise just think of it as a graph most of it will become very clear to you right so this is a very abstract transition system for a coffee vending machine so it says you look for money first right that is you expect a payment so somebody pays and then they get a menu where they can choose to buy coffee or tea so if they choose coffee you i mean if they choose tea you uh, choose tea give them tea if they choose coffee give them <coughs> coffee and then wait for the next person to come in and insert the money this is a very simple graph right uh, we call these things as finite state transition systems so these are called states in graph theory you call them vertices or nodes we call them states this thing with an incoming arrow is the initial state or the beginning state these edges are called transitions 
these actions are intuitive names that tell you what happens for the system to transition from this state to this state. So system waits in the pay state till somebody inserts the coin. When somebody inserts the coin, it goes to a state where it's ready to ex uh, let the uh, user choose a drink. And then once the user chooses the drink, it goes to the state where it's ready to vend that particular drink and then it resets itself to that. Right? So these are transition systems, graphs, where nodes represent states, edges represent transition. State describes information about a system at a certain point in its behavior. Here I've used nice names. It will obviously not be like this. There will be variables. Variables will take values. Those will be the names that happen in actual transition system. Right? Uh, like for example, if I take traffic light, state of a traffic light will be is the color of the light red, blue, or yellow. Sorry, red, green, or yellow. If I take a computer program, the state of a computer program will be the values of all the variables. Like we saw in the toy example, the value of x that will describe the state in which the program is and the statement that is currently executing. That's what the state of a computer program will be. If I take a synchronous hardware circuit, state will represent the values of all the registers. I should probably have an example of a hardware circuit, I'll see. So uh, yeah, a transition will mean change of color in a traffic light. In the, for a program, it will mean execution of one statement and changing of values. For this one, it means that, uh, you know, the hardware circuit goes through the next drop. So formally, we define them like this. So it's a graph that has so many things. It has a set of states. Yes, it has a set of actions. So these, these are the actions. Like get tea, insert coin, get coffee. Those are the actions. And uh, read this as transitions. So what does the transition tell you? From a state on an action, it tells you what the next state is. So I write it as the three tuple. Enabling state, action, resulting state. So it's a subset of this Cartesian product of three sets. So that is your arrow. Then there is a set of initial states then uh, these two I'll come back to. There is a set of atomic propositions and there is a labeling function, I'll come back to that. So actions indicate concrete actions of the system. Atomic propositions, uh, yeah, again, I'll come back. So here is, uh, uh, here is the same, same example. I've just written it out in the notation. So it has four states. What are the four states? Pay, select, T, coffee. It has three, uh, the initial state is pay. It has three actions, insert coin, get coffee, get tea. It has uh, five transitions. There's one here, one here, one here, one here, one here. These two don't have labels. That's all right. You can ignore it for now. I'll come back to it. But they basically tell you from pay, if I insert a coin, I go to select. So that's what is this, right? From pay, if I insert a coin, I go to select. The enabling state, action, resulting state. That's the three tuples. Right, uh, and now, okay, so we'll come to atomic propositions now. So, so let's say you have this toy coffee vending machine and you want to verify that it's correct. Can you give me one requirement of this toy machine? If you select tea, it better give tea. If you select coffee, it better give coffee. If I pay, it better show me the select menu. So these are the requirements, right? So. You write them in English, right? Now your job is to verify it. It looks like it's going to do it, but uh, it's small enough for us to see it and do. But uh, we want to verify it. So basically atomic propositions, this part that I said, I'll come back to you. They help you to write requirements and relate it to the machine. Like for example, there could be two atomic propositions. In this case, one says paid, the other says drink. Paid means paid is true. In which state will the variable paid be true? In this state, right? Here, so here paid is not true. And uh, in this state, it will reset itself. It will become false. So drink will be true in which state? Assuming that drink means it's delivering a drink, tea or coffee. So it will be true in this state and this state. In all other states, it will be false. So atomic propositions in the sense of propositional logic, Boolean logic, each is a Boolean variable, the same thing. So there is nothing much to it. So there is a labeling function that tells you in each state what's true. So in the state pay, paid is not true, it's not ready to deliver a drink. So 
so nothing is true right in the state coffee and in the state tree both paid and drink are true money is been received it's delivering a drink right in the state select only paid is true it's yet to deliver a drink right so i can so for example i can say always it is the case that paid implies in the next state drink i am saying the same requirement that you all said in a slightly more precise language always if paid is true then in the next state drink is true you are able to understand so always not paid implies no drink i can write requirements like this so this is what we write right always next day what happens yeah so here i just said transition system as is a set of states so there is nothing about it being finite but typically it is finite but it could be infinite it could be uncountable it could be anything as it's defined here but typically we look at finite state transition systems and uh, they uh, so transitions could be non deterministic uh, so the example that we saw was deterministic but by non deterministic in the sense what i mean is uh, from a particular state it has a choice to do more than one now it's okay to have such machines we can we can verify them also we may not look at examples of non deterministic statements so for a particular state we know which are the propositions that are true in that state so we call them in logic terminology satisfied at that state so we say a particular state satisfies the formula if the propositions in that state make the formula true so we'll see this what a formula looks like tomorrow so how does it semantics do semantics is basically a run or a behavior so in, in automata theory we call these things as a run so you basically start in one of the initial states execute an action change state keep moving keep moving like for example from the state pay which is an initial state if the action insert coin happens then you go to select state then uh, there was no action so i just put it at tau uh, it's like no action read it as no action in formal language theory we call it empty word epsilon so no action happens then you go to state t then get t action happen it goes back to pay from where insert action happens then just keeps doing it. this is called an execution of a transition system so the idea is for this execution will my requirement of always if paid implies in the next state get drink will it be true that's what i want to check and i can use standard graph theory algorithms to check it right that's what we mean so uh, an execution fragment of a transition system is an alternative sequence of states and actions so s is a state s0 s1 s2 s3 s are states alpha is that action that uh, get coffee select coin so such that from in the original transition system from si on reading alpha i plus 1 i go to si plus 1 finite execution stops somewhere and infinite execution can go on there is nothing stopping typically we are interested in infinite executions because i told you right we don't shut down these systems uh, unless this coffee vending lady uh, 6:30 she presses the switch off button but ideally we would like it to run through the night keep getting coffee and tea right so we don't want them to shut it down so these are some graph theoretic terminologies we may not even need them but uh, we are worried about what is called a maximal execution fragment which is either a finite that cannot be extended further or an infinite execution fragment then an execution fragment that begins in an initial state is an initial execution fragment a state is reachable this is standard graph theoretic a node or a vertex is reachable if it can be reached from a marked initial state by a path the standard graph theoretic notion of reachability there is nothing new to it right uh, so we are interested in reachability basically the most elementary model checking algorithms are reachability algorithms uh, so as i told you i'll give you an example of so models could be of any kind so we saw this toy model coffee vending machine so here is a by the way one of the biggest uses of model checking is in the hardware <coughs> industry two uh, companies like texas instruments intel ibm they all have their in house model checkers and uh, they routinely formally verify hardware models using that in triple it uh, professor subhir kumar roy he works on model checking as applied to hardware he is one person who who works in that uh, 
So this is just to give you an example of how modeling is done for hardware circuit. I hope all of you can read it. I have not put notations. This XOR, you understand what an XOR is, right? In the logical or the Boolean logic XOR. This is the not, the normal negation. This is our OR. So there is a X, there is a register, there is an output Y. You understand how this circuit works? It computes this function. Not X XOR with R. That's Y. Uh, I hope you don't have trouble in reading uh, this circuit, right? Uh, so the, uh, the register and the register changes. This this register changes as per this OR. So R changes with X or R, and Y is negation of R XOR with X. That that's this hardware circuit. So this is the graph model of the hardware circuit, right? Uh, how many variables are there? X, Y, and R. All three are Boolean variables. So how many states can I have? Two by three, eight states. Uh, I have chosen not to put R in this, uh, not to put Y in the state because Y is an output. So I have just kept X and R. And uh, so this is 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, just for X and R. Y is output not captured in the state. So this tells you how the transition system, the hardware circuit works. Right, uh, so in when I talk about tools, if somebody gives a circuit like this, this can be generated automatically. And if it has three boolean, if it has n boolean variables, the number of states is two power n. Right, uh, so you are talking about uh, suppose there's some property that you want to verify. That uh, so can you tell me one property that could be true? Some property of the circuit. Any thoughts? Something about R or Y? Any property? It's a toy circuit. When R is 1, Y is the complement of X. That's the first property. Is that correct? <clears throat> when R is 1, Y is the complement of X. If you're finding it difficult to show that it's correct or wrong, think of a simpler property. Please remember this is a, I mean, if you've seen real registers, this is quite useless. <laughs> it's an OR. So what can be true about an OR? So that's the only case. So can you elaborate a little more on that? <laughs> that's correct. Anything else? Y is true with X and uh, R are the same value. Okay. Anything else? <laughs> yeah. I mean, maybe yeah. We'll just move on. So the initial value of the regi uh, register. Once R is one, it keeps that value. Can you tell me why? You are able to understand, that's why I said it's an OR, right? I mean, it's a useless as a circuit, but what I'm saying is that you could conclude that it's useless as a circuit because the register doesn't change once it reaches one, right? So this is a useful requirement that you could infer using model checking. You realize that even for such a small circuit, we were not, I mean, I think I'm sure when once we get into this kind of thinking, we'll be fast. But these are, the, you know, large circuits, these kinds of conclusions about a register sitting in some corner somewhere will be very useful. And you can detect these kinds of conclusions very fast using model checking. That a particular register is not doing its job. You know, it, it is uh, it's stagnant and things like that. And this you can in easily infer by uh, analyzing a transition system like this. So I told you how to read it. So the state in the transition system is the value of x and the register. Transitions tell you what happened. And what is this? Can you tell me what these sets could be? Sorry? Variables which are true and false. That's what it marks. And uh, the once R is true, it stays <coughs> true. The only two transitions possible in this state are this and this. So R stays as 1. And once R becomes 1, again, the only two transitions possible are this and this 
an R stays as one. So what I did was some kind of a reachability analysis <coughs> on a graph. You are able to understand? Just ordinary reachability. I have to tweak my DFS or BFS a bit. But I just did reachability analysis and I can come to such useful conclusions. This is precisely what model checkers do. Right? Uh, the most elementary model checkers do this. 